Go ahead and keep something in Ezekiel 8, but uh, let's turn over to Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15. We're going to come back to Ezekiel 8, but uh, before we get into that, I want to get over to Proverbs chapter 15. In Proverbs chapter 15, once you're there, I want you to take a look at verse 3. Proverbs 15, verse 3, where the Bible reads, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. And the title of the sermon this evening is The Eyes of the Lord Are in Every Place. And really when we read that verse, I mean, it makes it pretty clear that there is nowhere to hide from God. You know, if we're down here on this earth, that there's no place that we can't go that, that God doesn't see us. And what it says there in that verse is that He beholds the evil and the good. Now, I don't know that that means just necessarily the evil and good that we do, but more so perhaps beholding the evil people and the good people. He beholds the righteous and the wicked. So what we know for sure is that there is no hiding place from God. The Bible says in Psalm 139, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I free, flee from thy presence? You know, God's everywhere we go. God sees everything that we do. Yeah. The Bible says in Job 28, He cutteth out rivers among the rocks, and his eyes seeth every precious thing. So God is even able to see the precious substance of the earth, the the jewels of gold and, and silver and the veins of silver and gold that, that men you know go to great lengths to mine out of the earth. God knows where they all are. I mean, sometimes the, 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 God could really spare man some trouble trying to find that stuff. He'd just reach down and say, it's right here. God sees all of that. He sees every precious thing. He sees the waters that are forgotten on foot. That it says there in Job 28. For he looketh unto the ends of the earth, the Bible says, and seeth unto the whole heaven. So God sees even to the ends of the earth, and He seeth under the whole heaven. The eyes of the Lord truly are in every place. And what's important to know about this sermon, and what we can learn from this sermon tonight, is that God is not just a casual observer. God is not one who's up in heaven, and yes, we know and understand from these verses that He can see everything, that His eyes truly are in every place. But it's not that it doesn't just end there, as if God is just up there with His popcorn just enjoying the show. God's not in a movie. God's not taking in a sitcom. God's eyes are in every place beholding the evil and the good. And He's very involved in the affairs of man at times when He decides to be. And people who understand this fact that the eyes of the Lord are in every place, they behave themselves accordingly. And this can either work for us or against us. This fact that God's eyes are in every place beholding the evil and good. I mean, we could, we could. It depends really on what we're up to. I said, I suppose, you know, if we're up to do the, the right thing and doing good things, then, then we, we we praise God that He sees us, and we know that He's pleased with us. But if we're not, and our own hearts condemn us, how much more so God, when His eyes are in, the, in every place? And now it says here in Proverbs fifteen three that the eyes of the Lord in every place beholding the evil and the good. It says He sees the evil. And that would be speaking, I believe, about wicked people. Not necessarily just evil things that we do, not sinful things. But that he actually sees evil people. And the wicked don't seem to understand this. And they don't seem to care much if they do. They think that God isn't paying attention. They think that God isn't keeping track. That God does not see. Are we there in Ezekiel still, chapter 8? Ezekiel chapter 8, if you're not there, I'll read to you from Psalm 94. The, you see, the evil people in this world, they don't think that God is really watching. Or they don't seem to care. The Bible says in Psalm 94, Lord, how long shall the wicked, how long shall the wicked triumph? How long shall they utter and speak hard things and the workers of iniquity boast themselves? They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thine inheritance. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. That's some pretty wicked deeds right there. To slay a widow, to kill a stranger, to murder the fatherless. I mean, these are heavy. Yet they say, the Lord shall not see. That's what the wicked say. People that do these evil things. Neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. He goes on and says, understand ye brutish. I love that word brutish. It means stupid. <laughs> it's stupid to think that God doesn't see you. Understand, ye brutish among the people, and ye fools, when will he be wise? He that planted the ear, shall he not hear? He that formed the eye, shall he not see? And that's pretty 
pretty powerful verse. I like that one where he says that. You know, you brutish, don't you understand that the one who put the, those eyeballs in your head, you really think he can't see? And I thought about talking about how complex the human eye is and how it's just a, you know, a testimony to God's creation. But I won't go too far into that. But I did think it was interesting. I got another quote here I'd like to read you. This is from a man. This man said, To suppose that the eye, with all its inimitable contrivances, for adjusting the focus to different distances, for admitting different amounts of light, and for the correction of spherical and chromatic aberration, could have form, been formed by natural selection, seems, I freely confess, absurd in the highest degree. So here's this guy saying, you know, basically it comes down to, when you consider how complex the human eye is and how amazing it is and what it can do, I mean, it's far more advanced than any telescope or camera that man has ever made. <clears throat> he, when he says, when you consider all that, he says, I confess, it's absurd to think that it just came about by chance. Yeah. You know who that man was? Dawkins. Charles Darwin. Oh, Darwin. <laughs> That's close. Though. Dawkins is a good guess, right? That was Darwin who said that. Yeah, I guess he didn't take it that seriously when he wrote that book. But that's kind of what he's saying here in Psalm 94. He's saying, don't you understand that the man, the one who made the eye, God who made the eye and the ear, is not going to see and hear what we're doing? Is he not going to behold the evil and the good? The evil, they don't think God's paying attention. They seem to think that they can hide from God. And we see that here in Ezekiel chapter 8. If you would, look with me at verse 1 where it says, and it came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in mine house, <clears throat> and the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord God fell there upon me. Then I beheld, and lo, the likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins even downward fire, and from his loins even upward as the appearance of brightness as the color of amber. And he put forth the form of an hand and took me by a lock of mine head. Picked him up by his hair. <laughs> God doesn't always... He's not like that, that painting of gentle Jesus with the little lamb draped <laughs> over him, just Amen. carrying him back to the fold. Sometimes when God wants to get somebody's attention and show him something, he makes sure he's got their attention. Picked him up by a lock of mine head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh, provoketh the jealousy. Now where was it? It was in the inner gate, the door of the inner gate. And the glory of the Lord, of God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw on the plain. Then said unto me, Son of man, lift up thine eyes now, the way southward. So I lifted up my eyes the way north. I mean, to, toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes to the, toward the north. And behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. So he's showing him, and he's showing him this abomination, this image of jealousy. I mean, it was, it, it's making God jealous. That's the one who's jealous over this image. In God's house, this idol, he names it later, the name of it, and that they had set up. They set it up, there it says, at the door of the inner gate. You see, they think they can hide from God the wicked, the evil. They don't consider, they don't think that God's eyes truly are in every place, and they hide. Where do they hide? They hide behind closed doors. That's where a lot of evil things go on, is behind closed doors. You know, we were we were talking at lunch with Brother Andrew over here. He told me a story about somebody. These these societies, these these wicked, evil societies, where they they do these wicked things. They do horrible things to people. Where do they do them? They do them in secret. Mm -hmm. They do them behind closed doors. And I really don't want to get any detail than that. But you know, there's a lot of things that we don't know that go on. Things that the Bible says are a shame to even speak of that are done in secret in this world really going on out there. It really affects people. And they do it because they don't think God is watching. They don't think that God can see. They have it behind the door, the inner gate, behind closed doors. And that's really, we should never as Christians think that just because we're in that seedy motel on the other side of town, or just because we've got the, 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 the shades drawn, and we've got the door locked, that nobody's going to know what we're up to. We should always understand that God's eyes are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Where else do these people do that? They do it in the dark. 
Look there in verse 6. He said, Furthermore unto me, Son of man, seest thou what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel committeth here, that I should go far from my sanctuary. But turn thee yet again, I, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then he said unto me, Son of man, dig now in the wall. And when I digged in the wall, behold, a door. And he said unto me, Go in, and behold the wicked abominations that they do there. So I went in and saw, behold, every form of creeping thing and abominable beasts, and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the wall round about. And there stood before them seventy men of the ancients of the house of Israel, and in the midst of them stood Jeazaniah, the son of Shaphan, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then he said unto me, Son of man, hast thou seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the chamber of his imagery? For they say, The Lord hath, seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. It's kind of a funny passage there the way it ends. He says, you see what they're doing in the dark? You know, he's got to go through the hole in the wall. He's got to see the door. And he's got to go through the door. And there they are in the dark with the incense and the smoke doing this, you know, worship, this abomination as God calls it. And they say at the end there, the Lord seeth us not, then why are you in the dark? <laughs> That's my question. The Lord hath forsaken the earth. If God doesn't see you, why are you hiding in the dark? You know, so there's something in man that always knows that God's watching. You know, when we think we're getting away with something, because nobody else has seen it, nobody else is around, part of us knows that God is watching. Part of us is still convicted. And we want to, to lie to ourselves and, and say, oh, God doesn't see, God sees. They say, God hath forsaken. They didn't say God doesn't exist. They didn't say, oh God, there is no such thing. They just say, he's not watching. He's forsaken. And that's why a lot of wicked people are very emboldened today. To do all the wicked and evil things. They think they're going to get away with all this wickedness. All these abominations that they do today. But if you really wanted to ask and get, get down to it, even in their own hearts, they know God's watching. And that's why they're doing it all in the dark. But some people are a little bit more bold. Some of the wicked who think that God's eyes aren't in every place, they get a little bit more bold. They're not like these guys hiding out behind the wall, behind the door, in the smoky dark room. A lot of them, they'll do it right in plain sight. He said there in verse 13, He said also to me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. And he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tamas, now, Tamas was, uh, from what I read in the cross you know, reference or whatever it was, it says here that that's a reference to an Assyrian fertility god. That he was the god of the fertile season. And every fall, when things died and the harvest was over, they would weep for this Tamas. <clears throat> it kind of reminds me, you know, if it's got something to do with fertility, it just reminds <coughs> me of you know, these abortion clinics. When I think about it, these women that are out there just weeping and crying aloud for their right to abortion on demand. I mean, they're out there just in the sight of God and everybody, just proclaiming, let us murder our children. Let us shed innocent blood. It's our right, our body, our right. That's where we're at. And he says there, then he brought me to the Lord uh, in verse 15. Then he said unto me, hast thou seen this, O son of man? Yet turn thee again. Yet turn thee again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than this. Do you notice every time it's just greater? Abominations, greater? You know, first he shows them the image of jealousy. He says, I'll show you greater abominations. Shows them the men in the dark worshiping the creeping things. And he says, I'll show you greater abominations. He sees these women just out in the broad daylight weeping for this false god. And he says again, I'm going to show you even greater abominations. And it just goes on and on. You see, they think they think God isn't watching. They think they can just get away with it. But it's very clear, the Bible's very clear, that they are not going to get away with it. You know, we're living in a wicked world that's continuing to get more evil and more wicked. And sometimes it just feels like maybe God isn't watching. Sometimes I think we can get a little discouraged in our hearts and think, does God see? 
Let me assure you, He sees. God definitely sees. And these people that think God can't see, they're going to think He's deaf one day. I'll show you what I mean by that. Look at verse 17. Then said He unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they have put the branch to their nose. Therefore I also will, will I also deal in fury, and mine eyes shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in mine ears with a loud voice, yet I will not hear them. They think God can't see. One day they're going to think He can't hear. They're going to think He's deaf. Because He's not going to listen to them. When they cry out with a loud voice, Stop! Why God? Stop it! Enough! Cease! With your wrath. But He's not going to hear it. Rest assured, there is no hiding place here. God's eyes truly are in every place. Go ahead and turn over to Revelation chapter 6. Keep something there in Ezekiel, but go over to Revelation chapter 6. The Bible says in Job 34, For though his eyes are upon the ways of man, and he seeth all his goings. Jeremiah 16 says, For mine eyes are upon all their ways. They are not hid from my face. Neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. God sees. Woe to them that seek to hide that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord and their works in the dark. And they say, Who seeth us and who knoweth us? They have these dark places. They have these places where they take counsel in secret. They have these places where they think that no one's watching. But God sees them. And one day the wicked really will wish that there was a place to hide. Not, but only for different reasons. They'll wish there was a place they could go where God couldn't see them. But it won't be so that they could practice abomination. Look there in Romans chapter or Revelation chapter six. It says, "And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty man, mighty men, and every bondman, and the free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. They're hiding in the dens and the rocks. You hear about these, you know, these deep bunkers that you know our government has up in the Rockies and things like that, where they've already just prepared." You know, I mean, even Hitler had his hideaway up back, you know, in World War II, or these last resort places all set up. They're going to go deep into these, into these uh, mountains. I don't know if that's what those are. Maybe. Seems likely though. They're going to hide themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and rocks, "Fall on us and hide us from the face of Him that sitteth on the throne, for the wrath of the Lamb, for, for, and from the wrath of the Lamb." For the great day of His wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? You see, they're hiding now. They're going to want to hide then. Mark it down, God sees. And He's keeping track. God sees it all. And He not only sees just what people do, the actions, the abominations that they do, He even sees and knows what we feel and what we think. If you would, uh, turn over to... Turn over to Genesis real quick. Genesis chapter 6. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, The Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. He said in Isaiah 66, For I know their works and their thoughts. God not only knows the works that we do, but He also knows the thoughts that we have. Amen. Here in Genesis 6, look at verse 5, And God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth. He sees the wickedness of man when it's great in the earth here in Genesis 6. But not only that, it goes on and says, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. He sees not only the wickedness that they do, but he sees what's in their heart. <clears throat> Keep something in Genesis. Go ahead and turn over to Psalm 139. Psalm 139, verse 23. You know, most people, I mean, David certainly understood this fact. That God's eyes are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. That God looketh not on the outward appearance, but on the heart. I mean, that was said about David. <clears throat> that he was seeking a man after his own heart. And, and 
And he, and he, he, uh, he wrote this psalm here. Where he said, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That's a great prayer. That's a prayer we ought to pray. That we ought to ask God to look at our hearts and see what's in them. Can we pray like that? What does God see when He looks at our hearts? What does God see when He's the only one that's looking? <laughs> see, the problem is not that God isn't looking. The problem often is what he sees. People are very mistaken to think that God isn't looking. But the fact is, is he is, is looking. The problem is with what he's seeing. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 16, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of those whose heart is perfect toward him. He said in Jeremiah 32, Great in counsel and mighty in work. For thine eyes are open upon all the ways of the sons of men to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruits of his doings. It's not a big deal that God's eyes are looking, that God sees in every place if our hearts are right. If we're doing right, we welcome it. You know, the, if, if we're sincere, then we don't mind that, that God would look and see what we, what we do. <clears throat> see, people that understand that God is watching... They, they can welcome God's gaze. If they know that God is watching and their hearts are right and their lives are right, they, at any time they can, they, can, they can rest assured and welcome God to look and see. And that's what I want to talk about next. We talked about the fact that the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil. But it also says that He beholds the good as well. Beholds the good. The righteous know that God sees them and they act accordingly. I'll read to you from John chapter 3. The Bible says in John 3, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. That's why they go into the holes and the caves and the rocks and the dark smoky rooms because they want to get out of the light because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh in the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. <clears throat> if we're doing truth, we don't mind when God kicks the door open and turns the lights on and shines the light on our lives and on our hearts and sees what we're doing. I want us to consider um, the testimony of Noah. And you're there in Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6. Uh, I think I told you to keep something there. I apologize if I did. But Genesis chapter 6. The testimony of Noah. We heard a testimony about Noah today. I'll tell one, didn't we? Me and Brother Alex, we bumped into a guy who, who told us that, that Noah was perfect. The Bible says he was perfect, right? And he had a kind of a misunderstanding about that, I think. Because uh, we know Noah wasn't perfect in the sense that he was sinless. I, I said, you know... So we go to my gospel and say, you know, the Bible says for all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Well, I don't understand. He's like, I don't agree with that. You know, all the prophets were sinless. I believe that. Noah was sinless. Oh, really? Noah, who, who, who got off the ark, one of the first things he did was plant a vineyard and get drunk on the wine. That guy? Okay. <laughs> I think that guy might have been getting into his own vineyard a little too much when he said that. <clears throat> anyway, that's kind of a different point in the sermon. But. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, And God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God looked down, and God's eyes were running to and fro in all the earth. He looked down, and he beheld the evil, and he beheld the good. He saw a lot of evil, but he saw Noah. And he Noah found grace. You know, and that should be us today. We could be, we could all go and be like Noah. You know, the whole world lieth in wickedness, and, and, and evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse as we draw near and closer to the end. Of, 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 the, of the world as we know it before the coming of the Lord, before the rise of the Antichrist. But let it be said, when God looks down and looks to and fro on the earth, that He can see a couple Noahs gathering together here in Tucson Amen. and elsewhere in the world. And then we could get some grace. 
man. God would be merciful unto us. I mean, it's a relief. God's ready to wipe out mankind. But here's one guy that found grace in his eyes. And God looked and saw him in Now, that didn't happen by accident, you know. Noah didn't just stumble in there. He doesn't wake up one day right with God. He had to purpose that. The Bible says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. When it says perfect, it means that he was whole. He was complete. He was perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. You know, he was, he was doing all the things that he was supposed to do. He was a just man. That's what gave him grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's what we need to be. We need to be just. And more than that, we need to walk with God. Isn't that what Noah did? It says that Noah walked with God. You know, Noah, I mean, what would that look like today? It would mean that, you know, if we're walking with God, then we're headed in the same direction. And we're thinking about our steps and where we're headed in our life. We're thinking about the things of God, not just here on Sunday, not just here on Thursday. But when we walk out that door, we understand that God's eyes are still on us. When we go back in our homes, when we go about our day and through our week, we understand God is still walking or still watching, and we need to keep walking with Him throughout the week, not just turn it off and on whenever we come to church. <clears throat> they said they understand, like Noah, the righteous do, that in order to find grace in the eyes of God, you have to walk with God. You know, get up and read your Bible. Be found praying, be found doing the things that we ought to do. The Bible says in 1 John, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. But if we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. The things that the righteous or the good do, God's eyes are beholding the evil and the good, the things that the good do, the things that they do that other people don't see in secret, if you will, the things that other people don't know about that they're doing, those things are pleasing to God. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, that thine alms may be in secret. He said, you know, when you do your alms, do them in secret. Don't let other people know what you're giving. Now, that's not talking about tithing. People get alms and tithing mixed up sometimes. And I want to preach a whole sermon on that one of these days. <clears throat> He's talking about when you're going to do good, you're, you feel like doing something nice for somebody, you feel like being generous or charitable, you do your alms. You know, you do it in secret. You don't sound a trumpet. You don't let, get, get everybody's eyes on you say, hey, look what I'm doing over here. You do it in secret. The things that the righteous do or the good do in secret, they're pleasing to their Father. They're pleasing to God. And they understand that God's watching. And it is. It goes on and says, And thy Father which seeth in secret, himself shall reward thee openly. He said, When thou prayest, enter in thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. You know, God's people need to do some things in secret too. Sometimes we need to go do some things behind closed doors. We need to go do some things that nobody else knows about. But the difference is the things that we do in secret ought to be pleasing to God. Not an abomination like the evil. And thy father, which it seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. He said, when you, when, you, when you fast, appear not unto men to fast. But thy father, which seeth in secret, and thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. You know, it's not a real long message tonight, but I did want to preach it because it's important that we understand. I think that's one of the things that will help us the most in our Christian life and in our walk with God is if we understand that guys, God's eyes are in every place beholding the evil and the good. And we'll turn to one last place here, and if you would, turn over to Luke chapter 12. It's important that we understand that because it's going to it's gonna affect our behavior. It's going to affect how we behave from service to service, how we live our lives, what we do with our time, how we invest our time. If we understand that God is watching, God is keeping track, it might keep us out of trouble. It might keep us from going into that place that we're tempted to go into. Or look at that thing that we're not supposed to look at or taste or whatever it might be. Those things that we know are not pleasing to God. Those things that we need to stay away from. Sometimes just the idea that knowing God is watching I mean, that's enough to kind of straighten us up. You think about our kids, right? It's amazing. Sometimes that's no, maybe not amazing. But my wife, sometimes she'll say, the kids will do something, you know, like kids do. And uh, mom's trying to get them to straighten up. And you know what she'll say? She says, 
And, and, and Bob will notice right away that I'm paying attention now. I know something's up. They're not doing what they're told. They're ignoring their mother. And all she'll have to say is, look at your dad. <laughs> and they'll look over and I'll be giving them that, you know, that look, the dad look, right? And it's amazing. I don't have to say a word. I just straighten up, right? Because they know that there's, you know, there's more than just a look behind when I look. <clears throat> but sometimes that's, and that's kind of what we need to know, be told sometimes about God. Is that, hey, you better look at your dad. He's paying attention. He's watching you. He sees what you're doing. The Bible, you're there in Luke 12, but it says in Proverbs 8, Blessed is the man that heareth me, watching daily at my gates. You know, if we understand that God's watching us, you know, sometimes the best thing for us to do is just watch right back. Why don't we just look right back at Him? Why don't we just get in the, in the book and take a nice long look at Him too? And maybe we'll start to see eye to eye. It says there in Luke chapter 12, I'm going to look at verse 35. The Bible says in Luke 12, 35, Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return from the wedding, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make him to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. Isn't that something to think that maybe one day God, the Lord Jesus, would serve you? That's <laughs> really something. That God would gird Himself and come and serve you and make you to sit down and meet at His table. But if not everybody gets that, you know who gets it? Those when the Lord cometh, He shall find watching. So that's the challenge is to, you know, understand first of all that the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding in the evil and the good. And if we're the good, then that won't bother us. We'll welcome God to look upon us. And while we're at it, we might, e we might even turn around and take a nice long look right back at Him. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer.